Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to D News Plus again today. I am Trace, and this is episode 4 of 5 in our series on monsters. So far this week we've talked about what monsters are and where they came from. We've talked about natural monsters. We've talked about man-made monsters, you know, things that we invented. But today we're going to talk about how diseases have created monsters. Not the monsters being the disease, but how we turn people into monsters because of diseases afflicting them going to be really interesting. The term monster does tend to have a negative connotation, something that we run away from, something we're afraid of. We've talked earlier about how monsters are used to teach people lessons and how we look at monsters differently depending on what's happening in society. That's all societal issues, right? Something we run away from and that we're afraid of, that's a societal definition. But the most basic understanding of what a monster is according to Webster's Dictionary, is an animal or play of abnormal form or structure, one who deviates from normal behavior or character. And in this episode, we're going to talk about diseases that turn those humans into those monsters. And not that these people actually are monsters. We want to be very upfront about that. We're just talking about how definitions have put people in that category, and then how society itself has treated some people as if they were monsters, just because they look a little different or sometimes really different. So things like the elephant man, something you've likely heard of if you've been around pop culture for the last, you know, 10 or 15, 20 years or ever. The elephant man is is basically a person with elephantiasis. The elephant man was actually a real person and that's what he most likely had. Elephantiasis is known as lymphatic filariasis. Essentially it's a a condition where the skin gets thick and hard from swelling due to lymph accumulation. Lymph is a system in the body that transports immune cells around, and it also cleans your body. It's separate from the circulatory system. And when lymph accumulates too much, it causes swelling, especially in the lower parts of the body, like legs and ankles. But it can also happen in the hands and the face and the head, in the breasts, and it happens in both genitalia of male and female. And there are two types, filarial elephantiasis, which comes from microscopic parasitic worms. They're transmitted through mosquitoes. Make sure you tune into our mosquitoes thing. And the worms then reside inside of the lymphatic system, which is responsible for then, of course, maintaining bodily fluids and moving things around. But as it destroys the lymphatic vessels, the swelling starts. There's also non-filarial elephantiasis, which comes from skin exposure to volcanic ash or irritant soil, like red clay that's got potassium and sodium in it and stuff. Those chemicals are absorbed, usually when walking around barefoot in certain areas of the world, and the chemicals irritate and block lymph vessels as well. So elephantiasis occurs. It's more common in subtropical climates and tropical climates, South America, Central Africa, Asia, Pacific Islands, the Caribbean. And it actually does affect quite a few people, 67 million people in 80 different countries. And about 18% of the world's population are at risk of elephantiasis. So as much as we call it a monster, it's actually not a monster. You know, it's not even a monstrosity. It's something that's fairly common. 18% of the whole world's population is at risk of becoming an elephant man or elephant woman. The next monsters we're going to talk about are Matt Damon and Greg Kinnear. Sup, guys? Maybe you saw the movie Stuck on You, where they play conjoined twins. That's just Hollywood, I'm sure you all know. But conjoined twins are actually a real thing. They're genetically identical twins born uh, with their skin and internal organs occasionally fused together. Various internal organs can be fused in a number of different complicated ways, and they develop from the same fertilized egg. So this is how it happens. They share an amniotic cavity, they share a placenta, and when the egg splits post-fertilization, it doesn't split all the way. And the parts that are still connected end up fused. I mean, you can have conjoined twins that are connected at the hip, the chest, the legs, the head. I mean, it can happen any number of different ways, although it is extremely rare. About once in every 200,000 live births. And most of those don't survive. 40 to 60% of the people who are born that way uh, are stillborn, and 35% only live for about one day. They're definitely not monsters. But because they are so rare, when they do live, we humans tend to treat them like spectacle. But they're people. People just like you and me, they're just connected to each other. It's FYI. 
Conjoined twins were also one of those things that were held up as monsters and somehow given this sense of power. But in reality, it was just a statistical thing that gave them that deformity. There's also monsters like Dracula, which modern science believes they can explain. When scientists looked at the descriptions of Dracula, the appearance and behavior was similar to something called porphyria. It's a disorder that affects the skin and nervous system due to a buildup of natural chemicals that produce porphyrin in your body. Porphyrin is essential for the production of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a thing on your red blood cells that grabs onto oxygen and takes it around. It's you know pretty important without it you wouldn't be able to carry oxygen throughout your body, but too much porphyrin and you can have a problem like sunlight sensitivity and insomnia and skin redness, which can make you look a little weird. And in the 10th and 11th century, it was actually fairly common for bodies to be buried in shallow graves. Sometimes the ground would shift and maybe you would see a pale body that looked like it had a bloody mouth, a reddened skin, right? That might think, Oh my God, that's a monster. (laughs) But in reality, it's potentially just somebody with porphyria. So to bring it back to this monster, Dracula, porphyria is actually an inherited condition. It comes from a mutated gene that's involved in the production of your hemoglobin. And it's pretty rare, about 20,000 cases exist in the US every year. And that's common enough that you could still see it around today. But if you don't understand the world around you, which is kind of the theme of this series, right? If you don't understand the world around you and you create an explanation and you see things in just the right way, or you believe things in just the right way, you could create potentially a a monster out of this. There's also a very famous uh, monster, if you will, the werewolf or werewolf syndrome. It's actually called hypertrichiosis. Uh, You could also call it the wolf boy, right? It causes a thick coat of hair to grow pretty much everywhere except palms and the soles of your feet. Scientists aren't quite sure where it comes from, but they think it's a mutation on the X chromosome, which switches on a hair growth gene, which makes hair grow in places like on the face. And it could potentially be a discovery that helps cure baldness, which I think is very funny. Thanks, werewolves, for that. Uh, And it could also be something that happens during the late stages of cancer when a gene is tripped that shouldn't. Very interesting. Humans are covered in hair anyway, so this is really a minor mutation. Do you remember Pluto, a crazy desert cannibal from the 1977 film The Hills Have Eyes? Of course you do. Played by Michael John Berryman. Anyway, his abnormal physical appearance isn't makeup. Let's do a quick Google search. It's science. Berryman was born with something called hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia. It's a rare genetic condition, and the symptoms of that uh, include the reduced ability to sweat, missing teeth, fine sparse hair, dark wrinkled skin under the eyes, an abnormal nose, eczema, earwax, impaction, and that affects one in 17,000 people worldwide. It's a genetic mutation. Pretty common, actually, one in 17,000 people. So because of his strange appearance due to this genetic mutation, he was cast often as a monster, right? It was part of his career, made a career out of it. So good for him, I guess. But it is something that we then place apart from normal versus abnormal. Zombies are also part of this normal versus abnormal discussion because there isn't a disease that science knows of that can bring people back from the dead or reanimate dead bodies. There's so much wrong with that whole storyline, but there is something called Cotard syndrome, which is called walking corpse syndrome. Super interesting, extremely rare. And unlike the other cases we've seen, this isn't a physical thing. You could look completely normal. Society would not label you a monster in this way because you wouldn't look any different. But Cotard syndrome is a mental disorder causing nihilistic delusions. Basically, people with this syndrome believe that they are dead or that they no longer exist. They may believe they don't have certain parts of their bodies. They may believe that they have rotting flesh, that they don't need to do certain activities like eating or showering or drinking because they aren't alive anymore. They are dead. Yes, they're still walking around and talking to you, but they're dead. This was reported as early as the 1700s, and we still don't know that much about it. It's probably linked to bipolar disorder, depression, or schizophrenia. We're still looking into it in the scientific community, but there are some pretty crazy stories, as you can imagine, connected to those affected by Cotard syndrome, including patients who think that they smell like rotting flesh or who are anxious that no one has burned their dead body yet. There are people who haven't eaten or used the bathroom in a long time and claim that their organs have melted because they're dead. 
If you want to read more about it, go down into the description, check out our show notes. But it's super rare. It's treated with antidepressants, antipsychotics, and mood stabilizers, and also electroconvulsive therapy in extreme cases. But those diseases, all of these different diseases, elephantiasis, you know, the, the wolf boy syndromes, the Cotard's syndrome, these are all diseases that are real things that science has identified that it's very easy to see has likely created monsters in one way or another throughout the history of humanity, especially with the help of society-inflicted stigmas, right? Society loves to put people in boxes. We've got the normal people and the abnormal people. And in some sense, monsters are created by, one, that interaction, and two, science. Monsters are just the coolest. And if you want to know more, you should tune into Monster Week tonight on Animal Planet. It starts at 8, 7 central. Tomorrow we're going to talk about, however, where these monsters really came from. You know, not diseases, not religions, not stories, but where they really came from. It's going to be really cool. Tell us down in the comments if there are any other diseases that create monsters in the ways like we've already discussed that maybe we didn't mention in this episode. Tell us down there. Please subscribe so you get more episodes of D News Plus every single day, and I'll see you tomorrow.